Hi everybody, this is Peter, Peter Beal, and I'm uh, going to talk for a few minutes about the artistic achievements of a very well-known artist from the 15th century, uh, sort of for many people one of the most recognizable names in the uh, Italian Renaissance, and that's Sandro Botticelli. Um, uh, Sandro, or Alessandro Botticelli, is primarily famous for a couple of paintings that I'll spend some time discussing today that focus on um, pagan, secular uh, themes, uh, not um, at least immediately uh, recognizable as having very much to do with uh, Christianity uh, as it's understood by most people, uh, say, <clears throat> later in the 15th century. So Sandro Botticelli stands out for many people uh, for two paintings in particular, um, one titled Primavera that we'll look at briefly, and The Birth of Venus, um, both today in the Uffizi uh, Gallery in Florence and Italy, <clears throat> and very popular, uh, attracting a lot of attention every day uh, that that museum is open. Um, for our purposes, the primary thing to think about with uh, Botticelli, we'll just use the last name, meaning Little Keg, there are a lot of interesting stories behind uh, artist names from this time. Um, the main thing to think about with regard to Sandro Botticelli is the nature of uh, his patronage. And to do that, we need to do just a tiny bit of a dive into um, basically where Florence is at politically as we come into the time of Botticelli's birth, 1444. The primary theme to keep in mind is the 1433 eviction of the Medici family, um, and then a year later the return of the Medici family, 1434, with Cosimo de' Medici uh, at the head uh, of that family. Um, Cosimo is particularly important for the identity of 15th century Florence the cultural identity, especially because of the um, extraordinary degree to which Cosimo and really the Medici banking family patronized the arts and culture at this point in time. Um, prior to uh, this period, we'll just make a rough number like 1450, there's a obviously any number, there are any number of individual art projects sponsored by leading families. Uh, the classic example being uh, Paolo Strozzi's uh, Adoration of the Magi by Gentile de Fabriano, um, or um, Felice Brancacci's um, patronage of the Brancacci Chapel uh, with the famous frescoes by Masaccio. Um, and, and certainly there are any number of other uh, projects along along this line, the Tornaboni Chapel, the list goes on and on. But I don't think there's too many other examples, really even in world art history, of a family making its stamp uh, so profoundly on uh, the urban fabric, the, the sort of architectural, artistic, and as it happens, intellectual fabric of a city. So to some degree, the story of Sandro Botticelli is very much intertwined with that of, um, with that of the Medici family. When we look at um, when we look at the work of uh, Botticelli, the first thing that we're really going to kind of focus on is uh, the degree to which it really is different from the um, the precedents of the immediate past, the first decade or two, maybe even three of the 15th century in Florence. And the best way to begin to think about the tendencies in 15th century, early to mid 15th century Florence is in terms of exploring um, art as a kind of vehicle for civic expression, art as a vehicle for naturalism, and a kind of increasingly, you might, I think, say accurately scientific approach to visual representation. So a good example, and we'll come back to the Primavera in just a second, but a good example by means of comparison would be to consider the paintings of fre the fresco here uh, by Masaccio, uh, dated uh, around 1425, uh, 27, depending on your sources, um, <clears throat> or the sculpture, very famous sculptural group here, 
uh, by Nani de Banco, uh, The Four Crown Saints, which is a, a classic uh, example of the um, revival of essentially Roman uh, uh, figural types, uh, dated around 1410. These two uh, images here in the uh, upper half and lower right stand out against the example of uh, Botticelli's Primavera uh, in the lower left here in a number of ways and it's certainly instructive to think about in both instances uh, by Masaccio and Nani de Banco the clarity of the message is really paramount. The idea in both cases that a figural grouping is involved in a critical moral decision um, in the case of the four crowned saints or martyrs uh, pondering the consequences of a decision to defy the emperor in the case of the Masaccio scene and these are probably closely related in terms of the purpose and arrangement of the figures but in the Masaccio painting Christ is uh, with his followers debating the uh, necessity to pay a poll tax the tax collector demands their payment right here they of course being sworn to poverty don't have any money the situation's resolved up to the side and Peter pays off the tax collector um, Masaccio has certainly gone to some trouble to make sure that all of the techniques of visual representation, the use of light to isolate and clarify the figures, the setting within a landscape, the framing by linear perspective uh, uh, and architecture, all of these features along with the dignified and monumental postures and gestures of the figures, all of this points to the seriousness of the kind of moral decision at hand and the potential consequences. And that's very different ultimately from the world that um, uh, that Botticelli conjures up. Let's go back to the Primavera just for a second in a bigger view. What we have here instead of a relatively clear and um, you know politically inclined and, and declarative uh, mode of presentation we have here instead is a much more allegorical presentation of a relatively esoteric um, and indirect and allusive kind of subject matter. So um, a, a quick tour of the painting um, points us to a number of um, a number of really not just figures but characters and qualities that they represent. So um, at, at the center of this is uh, the goddess Venus, you know, nicely haloed by this very um, a kind of two-dimensional outline of vegetation, and the theme of vegetation is certainly important in the read of this typical read of this picture. Um, she uh, sort of almost in this blessed uh, sort of gesture of benediction or blessing um, to her right. Uh, she has to her right the three graces. And you can see the Cupid blindfolded here is shooting uh, what appears to be using his bow and arrow, a flaming arrow, kind of, you know, aiming at them. Um, we have also to this side, uh, again to Venus's right, Mercury um, uh, wielding his caduceus here to, to fend off some relatively minor and kind of sad looking clouds drifting in from one side. Um, on the other side, we have this peculiar uh, sort of double figure here of um, Zephyrus, the image of the spring wind, um, basically kind of assaulting Chloris, this nymph figure. It's a typical staple of mythology, particularly in the Ovidian mode. Um, and it's, it's kind of clear that the legacy into the vernacular of Roman poets is starting to pick up, especially the invention of poetry. Whether Botticelli knew of this personally, I think is still an open question. But regardless, this swooping, allegorized wind figure dives in and in the process is transformed, the implication seems to be, into Flora, the goddess of spring, hence the name Primavera. So what's going on in all of this is a great question. There's certainly no clarity of moral urgency or uh, sorry, clarity of agency or sense of moral urgency in any of this. The figures are kind of related, but not particularly. There's a sense 
of a kind of discrete space. You can see this as you follow around. There's no real sense of unifying them in terms of their, you know, their narrative um, drift uh, or purpose. There's, it's, it's all of it's implied, all of it's elusive, um, a real lack of direction. <clears throat> For instance, in the gestures or the postures or just about anything um, that these actors are doing is unclear. And that lack of clarity in the anomalous figures and positions and groupings lead most interpreters to consider this to be an allegory, that is to say the figures stand for something else, and um, point out to the likely circumstances of the painting's uh, creation that it's related to um, a wedding within the Medici family in 1482. Um, and so this is kind of interesting comparing again to the Masaccio, because what you have there is a much more clearly public, or in the Nani de Banco piece, even more explicitly public purpose, a kind of promotion of civic identity, and not um, a work of art created within the milieu of an elite and aspiring aristocratic uh, family, like a like a picture made for uh, the Medici. So what's going on with this? If uh, a sort of classic you know, the a quick version of the interpretation that Venus has two natures. Uh, Venus has a, a kind of um, physical and lusty type of uh, uh, characteristic to her, and this is uh, kind of destructive. Um, or is there a kind of intervention on the part of, um, in essence, a kind of reason, a rational aspect, it sees her in a much more benign and intellectual and elevated sense. And for the success of a marriage, it's best that the lustful side be, um, you know, subdued or tamed somehow. That seems to be the purpose uh, of this particular uh, piece. Um, its subject matter is, again, obscure. It's real content, that is to say, the meaning it conveyed to a viewer is meant to be somewhat... Um, difficult to understand or make out. Um, and its presentation of its subject matter um, is equally difficult to read or make sense of. The sense of depth or you know integration of figures into a landscape, let's look again at the Masaccio, um, that Masaccio achieves in his piece, or the fact that the figures are somehow subject to the laws of gravity and human physiognomy and physiology, that seems to be utterly absent in Botticelli, and in fact is a typical characteristic of much of his uh, mythological work. So it's pretty clear as we come into the 1480s, and again the rise, um, especially after the death of Cosimo, 1464, and the rise of Lorenzo uh, il Magnifico, Lorenzo the Magnificent, who dies in 1492, um, that a new courtly art, less concerned with the kinds of functionality um, and a much more rigorous or even quasi-scientific type of art, um, those concerns are much diminished. Um, and this might help explain why uh, right around the time that Botticelli is creating uh, the Primavera, uh, Leonardo da Vinci is hitting the road to Milan. In the next piece, uh, sorry, in the next uh, video, we'll look briefly at uh, Botticelli's other well-known painting, The Birth of Venus, and consider in more depth um, the kinds of interpretations particularly aligned along the thought, uh, school of thought known as Neoplatonism and the role that scholars such as Marsilio Ficino may have played uh, um, in the uh, creation and or interpretation of, uh, of that painting. So we'll see you then.